You're listening to the Copywriter On Call podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Gillis, copywriter, word magic maker, and owner of What Sarah Said. On this podcast, you'll feel empowered to show up online in a way that has you saying, that's so me. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the Copywriter On Call podcast. I am your host, Sarah Gillis, and I am clocking some on-call hours today with a friend of mine, Jade Boyd. Jade is a business and productivity coach who helps busy service providers simplify and scale their business with strategy and systems so that they can earn more, work less, and create a freedom-first business. She uses her signature business minimalist framework to help women focused on doing less but better in their business. I am so excited to have you, Jade. Thanks so much. It's always great talking to you. So excited for our chat. Of course, of course. So I would love for you to just introduce yourself. Tell everyone who you are, what you do, and what you love about what you do. Yeah. So I'm Jade Boyd. I'm a business and productivity coach for service-based businesses. I'm living in Iowa City. We've been here since 2011. So it kind of feels like I'm from Iowa City at this point, but I'm a Midwest gal born and raised in Iowa. And my husband and I do DIY home renovation projects, which are almost done. And I'm pretty sure when they're done, we're just going to move. So it was really strategic on our part, but it keeps us busy in our free time. Um, I'm also a podcast host. So I have the Business Minimalist podcast where I teach about productivity and strategy and systems for business owners, which is my passion and what we're going to be talking a lot about today. And I would definitely consider myself a minimalist in all areas of life, definitely in business, like you mentioned, focusing on doing less but better and prioritizing the things that really matter. That's a philosophy that I try to apply to every area of my life and my business. And It's something that keeps me grounded and helps me stay focused on the things that are actually driving results and something that I preach and teach and coach to my clients too. I love that. I love that. And I'm not surprised at all that like your home renos are almost done and that you're going to be like, okay, ready to move on. (laughs) Yep. The timing is very bad. But also we recently found out that we are pregnant. So that would be the deciding decision on how long we can make this space work for us because we both work from home. And so making room for a baby, it was this like 70s bachelor pad party house when we bought it or my husband bought it a year before we got married actually so I had no say in the decision but I've had a lot of say in the renovation decisions (laughs) so it's a smaller house and I love having a smaller house actually as a minimalist because it does force you to make smart decisions and it also allows me to say no to certain things that family members want to give me (laughs) because I always had the excuse and we don't have storage space for that. But after having kids, things might change. We'll see. Yeah. I love that for you. And I can't wait to see where your next adventure takes you both as a mama, but also where you move to and all of the things and how you make that space your own. I'm excited to see how that works out too. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Tell the audience a little bit about your background as a photographer and why you made the pivot into business coaching. We first met when you were still a photographer. So I would love to know how that transition has gone for you. Yeah. So like most people, I started my business without certain clarity on what it was going to end up looking like. I actually started my business after getting my MBA in marketing and I went to grad school because I knew that I wanted to do something different. The nine to five lifestyle, not necessarily job itself, but the schedule was really crushing my soul. And so I went back to grad school thinking that this is going to open up more opportunities. I love studying business as an undergrad. And so getting my MBA made a lot of sense. And I have always been in love with the strategy and marketing piece of running a business and entrepreneurship itself, but I was just ingrained with this belief that business ownership is for startups and software companies and million dollar ideas. And so in the back of my mind, I was thinking someday when I have that million dollar idea, then I'll become an entrepreneur. But through grad school, I had a bunch of different experiences that kind of opened my eyes to the fact that if I went back to the corporate job or the path that I was going to head down, the path that I was being pushed down, um, it was not going to end well for me. And so I had a laundry list of small business ideas that I thought about starting. 
a coffee shop was actually top of the list. And I'm glad I didn't do that because 2020 was right around the corner and that might not have ended as well. But photography was the easiest one for me to pick up, buy a camera and start doing immediately. So that's what I did. Um, I was also marketing consulting part-time for another entrepreneur about 20 hours a week and helping her clients with their branding and marketing strategy. And that's something that I really enjoyed doing, but I was doing both at the same time and eventually realized that I loved the business side of photography more than the photography part. So I was already niched into brand photography and only working with business owners, but people naturally started asking me to help them with systems, asking questions about marketing strategy, branding, uh, messaging, all of the business side of things that I really loved. And it's stuff that I was naturally just talking about because I was passionate about it anyway, as I was a photographer. And honestly, it was a very slow, it felt slow to me. It was maybe fast in the grand scheme of things, but the clarity that it took to pivot away from photography, it was a really hard transition for me because it was literally burning my business to the ground and starting over. And as a photographer, anyone who's listening who is a photographer, which I think you have quite a few of them, mm -hmm. it's a big investment to start a photography business. I had all the gear, all the backdrops, all the props for flat lays and product photography, and it invested a lot in photography education. And so to pivot into coaching, it did feel somewhat that I was, it was a hard decision because I was questioning, is this actually the right move? Is this a smart thing for me to do? But um, eventually I just had to do it because I was not happy, not for the sake that I wasn't making money or that I was working too much. I just wasn't lit up by the work that I was doing with clients. Whenever I got a client inquiry, I had this sense of dread of like, please don't hire me. And that is not what a sustainable business is built off of. And so slowly started saying yes to more and more of those projects, pivoted away from photography and into coaching. And then it was kind of a slow transition, trying a bunch of different things, done for you services, VIP days, three month coaching packages, and has led me based on the common questions and um, like strategies and systems that I was teaching my clients about to roll that into my group coaching program, which is the business edit, which you mentioned is my signature framework for building a productive business based on focusing on what matters and focusing on simple, intentional strategies and also simple systems. I love that so much. I resonate so much with so many aspects of your story from feeling like you were going to be crushed by the nine to five, like gosh, girl, when I was teaching, like I just, even the, the nine to three, <laughs> which was yep. really what I was living in. It was, it was really exhausting to continue showing up in that way every day, even if you didn't feel like it, even if you felt sick, even if you didn't feel like you had anything to offer and yeah. looking for something else felt like burning it down. Like mm -hmm. looking outside of that comfort zone felt like burning it down. And I, I never saw business ownership coming. Unlike you, that's a big difference for me. I never saw it coming, but I'm so grateful to be in this space and to have that control over my schedule and my output. And just my creative process has been such a game changer for me. And I love that you looked at that nine to five and said, that's not what I want. Let me go build something that's mm -hmm. outstanding. Yeah. And technically for me, it was an eight to five. And even with that schedule, it is so hard to have a life outside of work when you are showing up 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and driving in and parking and walking downtown. It takes up a lot more time and like props to people who have full time jobs and thrive in that environment because it does take a special type of person, I think, and a special yes. type of passion for the work that you do. But it just was not me. Yes, absolutely. I'm so glad that there are people that thrive in that environment. Like you said, that was just not me. Yep. So what is most fulfilling for you now as you are actively coaching clients and supporting them? What is the most fulfilling part of finally stepping into that space and, and owning that role in someone's life? Yeah, I think the most rewarding thing from a personal perspective is to feel like what I'm doing matters and to feel like I'm able to show up and be myself and do things that I would probably be doing anyway. Like I would still be reading books about business strategy and productivity 
even if it wasn't my job, I would still be learning about those things because I really enjoyed doing it. So it's really rewarding to have a job where what you like doing and what you get paid to do <laughs> line up. It feels really good to be in that space and feel like you're making a real difference, you know, using the things that you're naturally Either. gifted in and learning about to help other people who might not be as interested or passionate, but still have to have to do those things to get the job done. On a client side of things, I think the most rewarding thing to see in them is the type of business owner they become. Because a lot of my clients come to me because they feel like they're good at what they're doing. They're good at writing. They're good at designing. They're good at podcast management or whatever it is that they do. But they have this misconceived notion that I'm not good at marketing or I'm not a systems person and seeing their identities change and seeing that growth and the development, especially working with clients over a longer period of time where they become very savvy in their marketing. They become very smart and strategic and are able to take that baseline knowledge and get more practice. And after their learning, coming up with just brilliant ideas and become the type of business owner that they need to become to get to the next level in their business. And then of course, like the wins outside of business are super fun to see too, because that's what is most important. And what I focus on with my clients, how do you build a business that allows you to have a life, like a life first, a freedom first business. And so I had three clients quit their full-time jobs to go full-time this year, which is like the best mm -hmm. thing to celebrate with them. It's like a huge life change and a huge celebration. So rewarding to see that and just helping them feel more aligned and excited about the work that they're doing, not feel like it's a drag or I don't know what to do next. And this is never going to go anywhere. But seeing them start to believe in themselves as they're getting those results too, I feel like that's the most rewarding part about coaching. Yeah, the confidence, seeing the confidence transform the the person, but also transform the business, right? It has yeah. reverberations. I think that's so awesome. I always love working with clients in a way that helps them to feel more, more like themselves in their business and more like themselves just in their body. And I feel like there's so many ways you can do that, but it starts with that confidence. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people think that there's one way to market a business. And if I don't fit myself into this box or do the certain strategy that person A, B, and C on Instagram is doing, then I'm not going to be successful. But then flipping that on the head and being like, okay, here's strategies. Here are things that are true and research backed about owning a business. But also when you align your business to what you're good at and who you actually are, and it becomes natural for you to show up, that's when you make the best connections and it starts to feel easy. Yeah. And I love that you said that there's not one way to market. Everyone looks at marketing from a different perspective. Everyone consumes information differently. Everyone shops for things differently. And so when we as consumers are evaluating who we want to work with, we're so nuanced and different in the way that that works. So why shouldn't marketing also be different in that same vein? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So you work with a lot of your clients on productivity and especially as it relates to how often they are working in or working on their business. And we talked about that grind of like the nine to five and feeling like we didn't have lives in the space. There was not space for the life in between that, right? So mm -hmm. what is the first step that you take with your clients when it comes to that desire to be productive? Yeah. So the first step is actually defining what does it really mean to be productive and changing your mindset on that. I had one person tell me recently, we were talking about podcast content and she's like, yeah, I don't even listen to the productivity content on your podcast because I know I'm not going to do it anyway. And so shifting the mindset that productivity is this some like hard structured thing that sucks and forces you to live a life that you don't want to live or get up at a time that you don't want to get up at. I think that's the default perception when we talk about being productive because that's our culture's definition and what most people's standards are when it comes to working, right? Like doing the grind, getting as much done, achieving as much as quickly as you can, climbing the ladder. And that's not necessarily what productivity is when you're looking at it in a more holistic perspective. So 
I talk about redefining productivity in three different areas and using these three metrics to look at, am I actually being productive, whether in business or in life? So the first one is efficiency. So there's definitely that element of getting things done quicker, not wasting time or dragging things out longer than they need to be. That's definitely a part of being productive, but that can absolutely be a trap if that's the only way that you're measuring things because there's always going to be more to do. There's always going to be more to achieve. There's always going to be someone else who's further along than you are. And if you're only focused on getting as much done as quickly as possible, it doesn't actually help you get results or results that are meaningful in terms of the life that you want to live for most people, unless you're a robot, which I am not. Um, (laughs) The second one is getting meaningful results. So how do you know if how you're spending your time or the tasks that you're doing are productive? What results are they actually getting you? Is it just busy work that feels like you're doing something, but it actually gets you nowhere? Or is it the type of task or the type of time-consuming thing that is actually getting you meaningful results in your business or in your life? And then the third measure I like to think of is just overall quality of life because there has to be a balance between getting things done and the, the doing and achieving part, which is important and has a place. But also living a productive life has this element of quality of life and the type of life that you're living and how you're spending your time and like the the overall meaning. If you spend your entire career just being really efficient and getting result after result after result, at the end of your life, you might look back and think, you know what, that was not the most productive use of my time and there should have been a better balance there. So the first step in figuring out how to be productive is shifting what that actually looks like for you, but also focused on getting the right things done. How can I be faster at what I'm doing? But also, what can I do that's going to drive real results? And how can I shape my business, shape the way that I'm spending my time so that my quality of life improves? And that's different for everybody. How you want to spend your time is totally individual to you, how you want your morning routine to look, your habits, all of those things. But it's generally focused on building the type of life that you want to build. Yeah, I love that. I think it's so important to think about that productivity being so individualized because it doesn't look the same for everyone. Everyone's lives, everyone's businesses, everyone's processes, they don't look the same. And neither does everyone's definition of success. And for some, success might be, you know, dollar signs. For some, success might be, hours worked or, you know, achievements made. But for other people, it's like, how many hours did I not work this week? Because I could be with my family or I could be doing Mm -hmm. something I love. And I think it's so important to define those terms that, you know, were spoon fed to us for so long about what is productivity, what is success, but really taking the time to redefine those for yourself. That's such an important step. Yeah. And starting with the clarity that it takes to know what you want is actually really difficult. And I think that's one of the reasons why people shy away from productivity because they don't know what they want. And when you ask someone just straight up, what do you want your schedule to look like? That's a big question to ask without any specific like framework or criteria on how to actually build a schedule that is aligned, especially as a business owner, when you might be responsible for wearing a lot of different hats what does that even mean to be productive and to do things that are moving the needle? And so I found that finding clarity actually is a step that most business owners will skip because it's a lot easier to just be like, oh, productivity, I will block out my morning routine or I will start journaling and jump to those easy things that actually don't move the needle that much instead of starting with, what do I actually want my life to look like? And does my business align to that? Because the answer can be kind of scary sometimes. Yeah. And I think it can shift and change, right? Like you're about to enter a new season of your life as a mama and a a new homeowner eventually. And so when you're thinking about those new seasons and what productivity looks like in those seasons, it's different than, you know, maybe a year ago and allowing Mm -hmm. that, that clarity to, to be something you're continuously seeking is really important. So how do you help, how do you help your clients find clarity? So I like to say that there's two types of clarity and the one that we all want is that instantaneous. I know exactly what I need to do next clarity, which is not very common. I call these Grand Canyon clarity or brand photography clarity in my own life. 
Uh, there was a moment in grad school, I did my summer internship at Grand Canyon uh, National Park as a business consultant. And so that summer was one of the most amazing summers of my life. And I did have that instant moment of clarity while I was there realizing this is the type of lifestyle that I can live and also have a job that I feel is meaningful and contributing and important. I can have both. It, I don't have to choose one or the other and go the corporate route or just do nothing. <laughs> like there's yeah. an in-between and I can make the type of career I want to. And so I did have an instant moment of clarity when I was hiking in the Grand Canyon, which is very picturesque and romantic thinking back on it. But I had a moment of clarity where I said, I am not taking a corporate job and I'm going to start my own business. But those moments are pretty few and far between. I can only come up with like a handful in my entire life where I've had that level of clarity that quickly. And then brand photography clarity, like I said, I think of my experience transitioning from brand photography into coaching and figuring out what was next for my business. And that took years. And that is usually what finding clarity looks like. Like you said, there's different seasons and there's different things changing in our life and things happen gradually sometimes and that's okay too. So when you talk about finding clarity, it's not like you're going to decide this is what my schedule is going to look like and this is the type of business I'm going to build and then it's never going to change again. There's probably going to be a little bit of both types of clarity happening. But I think it also takes the internal reflection and not just once a year, which is what most people do, but kind of that continuous introspection and self-reflection on how things are going, what's working, what's not, what's draining you, what's exciting you in your business, and learning about yourself along the way because you're constantly changing. Like you mentioned, in every season of life, we become a new type of person, and so it is backwards to assume that we're always going to want the same things. It's going to change. And keeping in tune with ourselves and checking in with ourselves is really important. But also with my coaching clients and anyone who does business coaching, there's also that element of the external observation of what's happening in your business and life. Because there's many things that we just can't see for ourselves, patterns that we're in, patterns of behavior or thinking or actions that we're taking over and over again that we may think are good. But sometimes it takes that external perspective to say, hey, what is going on here? Like, why does this keep happening for you? Or why did you say yes to that again when last time this is what we talked about? So finding clarity is messy. It's chaotic sometimes. And it's okay if it happens gradually. That's the natural way that it happens. Yeah, I love that. I love that so much. I think that when you talk about Grand Canyon moments, like there have been a, a, a few of those in my life, but man, it's more of the the slow burn. Like you were talking about the, mm -hmm. the brand photography moment where you're like, okay, well, what else is there? What else mm -hmm. could I be doing? What else could I discover about myself and about what excites me and what feels good. So I love the distinction that you made there. And of course, how perfect is it that it's the Grand Canyon moment, right? That it's that it's a few of those moments in life that really do shape what we do. Yeah, it paints a pretty picture for sure. But it does. It also is not the prettiest picture when you think of like, oh, crap. Now I have <laughs> this clarity. What am I going to do with that? Right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. This episode is brought to you by StorySale, my three-month group coaching program that supports creatives who are ready to market their magic. In our three months together, you'll have access to group coaching and co-working calls, guest expert calls, weekly one-on-one -on -one Voxer support with me, one-on-one -on -one intensives to focus on your website copy, SEO page titles and meta descriptions, and email welcome sequence. Eight spots are available this round. Is one of them for you? Story sale is a good fit for you if you love the work you do as a business owner, but you're stuck in a cycle of serving less than ideal clients who don't let you up. Story sale works for you if you know you need to invest in your marketing from your website copy and SEO to your email list, and you want to do the work with a roadmap for success and a coach you can trust. Story sale is a good fit for you if you don't want to face another busy season without the accountability you need and a rhythm to your work that promotes productivity. Let's talk about what's possible for you inside story sale. What if you could stop relying on your portfolio to convey your impact in favor of connecting to your ideal client through words? 
What if you could stop looking at your competition's website to see how they portray their value in favor of trusting your own story that sells for you consistently? If you're tired of playing it safe with your marketing, building your business on property you don't own, like Instagram, instead of creating a website that sells for you consistently instead, Story Sale is for you. It's time to stop feeling alone and uninspired in your work. Visit whatsarahsaid.com slash coaching or click the link in the show notes to learn more. I would love to see you inside. So let's say that a business owner is listening to this episode and they just feel stuck. Maybe they're overwhelmed. Maybe they're anxious. They want to be more productive. They want to be more efficient in their business. They want to maybe use their time a little bit differently than they are currently, but they don't know where to start. Do you have a baby step that they can take today just to start moving towards a more productive business and life. Yes, absolutely. Um, Before I get to that, though, I would say for somebody who's feeling super overwhelmed and the thought of, quote unquote, being productive or transitioning to a new system or adding anything to their calendar at this place, at this point, if that sounds overwhelming and they're really in the thick of it, I would say focusing on the journey and not the destination. Mm -hmm. And Focusing on systems and processes and routines over goals or achievements or one-time things is a really important shift to take when it comes to being productive. Um, We, everyone knows about James Clear and Atomic Habits. So I Mm -hmm. like to quote this all the time, but he talks about setting systems and not goals because the systems and the actions that you're taking every day, that's what matters in the end anyway. Your goal is probably going to shift a little bit. And whether you hit your target by your deadline won't matter as much. It will matter more the person that you're becoming and the routines and systems that are in your business. Because even if it's slow growth and slow shifts, those small actions add up over time into results that you would never get if you try to force it and cram those achievements into the next 90 days. So first of all, shifting the mindset on how can I set up systems and processes in my life that make things easier and starting with one, like what is the bottleneck? What is the cause of the most frustration? What is one way that you could make more room for joy or more room for family or whatever it is that's got you feeling like this is overwhelming or this is missing and I'm not feeling fulfilled? Thinking about that one thing that you can change and starting there. But a more tangible tip for someone who's like, ah, I'm a little overwhelmed, but I'm I'm good to make some changes right now. My favorite thing to recommend is a weekly review process. And I like to say that a productive week equals a productive life. Starting small with that bite-sized chunk of time and figuring out week by week, how can I just make one improvement to my week so that I can be more productive? How can I make just 30 more minutes to work on my goals or 30 more minutes to work on my marketing or whatever that small shift is that you want to take, but also having that check-in with yourself week by week and asking the hard questions so that you're not sitting down once a year and realizing like, wow, I wasted half the year doing things that didn't actually lead anywhere and having those smaller bite-sized check-ins so that it doesn't feel as overwhelming or defeating when it's like, okay, it was just one week. I can pick myself back up. I can make changes next week. If it didn't go as planned, there's always something that you can do differently. And I have a free download for a little checklist to go through. If people want a weekly review checklist or some quick questions and things to check in on as a business owner, we can definitely link that. But starting small with a weekly review would be my first recommendation. I love that so much. We'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes. I've tried that myself. I've gone through your um, your free download. And honestly... Just taking stock of what am I spending my time doing and how much time is are things actually taking, that is such a, an eye-opening experience. Whether it's cooking dinner or taking a lunch break or talking to a client or working on you know a deliverable for a client, actually getting up close and personal with the way that you are spending your time can really help to illuminate opportunities for you. And like you said, it's a growing process, right? You can start with a week. And if that week didn't go well, try again next week, right? Mm-hmm. So I love that, that that kind of guideline is there to help us learn. I also love doing it at the end of the week because it makes me feel like I'm able to fully shut off work because I combine 
reviewing my week with planning the next week. So I'm not trying to like review this week. These are the changes I need to make and then pick it back up on Monday when I've already forgotten everything. (laughs) I just do it all on the same day on Fridays. And it's a really helpful routine for me to wrap up work so that I'm actually able to go into the weekend not thinking about like, what do I have to do next week? I have to make sure I don't forget to do this or, you know, doing that outside of work work and able to be fully present during my weekend so that it's actually more restful. Uh, Sometimes I won't say I'm perfect at doing a weekly review. I try to do it every single Friday, but I definitely feel it on the weeks when I don't get to it on Fridays if something is off in my schedule because I will enter Monday feeling a lot more like the Sunday scaries feeling, right? Like, oh man, what's going to come down the line this week? I'm not prepared yet. Yeah. Or what am I forgetting? Those those Mm -hmm. middle of the night thoughts that come up. I think that's one of the things that taking stock of what did I do this week? What's on my plate next week before the week even ends, before the work week even ends? That's that's so key to like when I wake up Monday morning, I don't feel like, oh, man, I'm forgetting something. There's got to be something out there that I'm forgetting. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And our minds also work so creatively when they're offline, too. And so giving yourself that space on the weekends to not think about work, I think people will be surprised if you don't do that regularly how much it helps to have more creative ideas and to think outside the box when you are able to shut off work because naturally good ideas will come to you when you're doing things that are mindless or spending time outside or cooking meals. To me, ideas always come when I'm walking or in the shower because if you're thinking about those things on Friday, like these things are coming next week, these are the projects I want to make sure get done your subconscious mind is going to be thinking about those things without you having to force it and for it to take more of your time and energy or stress too, which takes a lot of emotional energy actually going into the next week. So it's kind of a fun hack too. Yeah. I love that so much. My creative process is so much better when I am able to unplug, whether it's an evening, a whole day on a Saturday, a whole weekend, like that unplugging time where I can just be me, be Sarah, read a book if I want, take a nap if I want, take the dogs for a walk if I want. Those times really do refuel me between busy client-filled weeks. So I think there's Mm -hmm. definitely something to that for sure. 100%. So I want to ask you your opinion about social media because when it comes to productivity and social media, it feels like they're on opposite sides here. Like my clients tell me a lot that social media feels like a big time suck. And Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you have any tips or tools or any sort of like guardrails almost that we can put into place that help us to use social media in a way that is still productive, but doesn't suck us in and take away all of our, our time. Yeah. So I think it comes back to that first question. Like the first step in being productive is defining what does productive look like? So if social media is feeling unproductive, clarifying what is unproductive about how I'm using it or the way that I'm engaging with the app or the way that I'm creating content and what would productive even look like? Is there a productive version of me using Instagram for my business? And for most business owners, I would say the answer is probably yes, but it's tricky because social media is designed to be addictive. So it's definitely a double-edged sword when it comes to being productive on social media. But I would start with the question of like, why is social media a time suck? Is it because it's not actually getting me results? Or is it because I have no clarity on what I'm actually supposed to be doing when I'm in the app? So I just start scrolling. Or is it because I'm truly addicted to the dopamine hit of social media and I'm looking for the likes and the comments and have just created the internal habit or like the procrastination habit of checking social media every 15 minutes, what is unproductive about it? And then that will hopefully point you to the solution, which would be guiding yourself towards what productive looks like for social media. So some more specific advice on making social media productive. The first thing I would say is get clear on your marketing strategy and the role that Instagram or whatever social media you're on actually plays, how you're going to show up and what you're going to talk about. And Mm. be really clear about that because if you're not, it is so easy to fall into that trap of, oh, I'm just going to look for ideas or I'm going to go engage with people. What does that actually look like? And be really specific so that you can tell on a moment by moment basis, 
am I doing what's productive or am I off the off the rails going, you know, beyond those bumpers, like you said. The second thing I would say is batch scheduling. And if social media really is a problem and you can't get in there because you are addicted and will start scrolling or know that you're prone to those distractions at certain points of the day, batching it and scheduling it so that you don't have to actively be on the app as often can be really helpful for some people. And then my favorite hack is this app called OneSec, which is an app that you can download on your phone and you can use it to delay the opening of any app on your phone. So if you find yourself constantly checking your email or constantly checking TikTok or whatever your drug of choice is when it comes to dopamine hits, you can download one sec and it will just delay anytime you click on the Instagram app, for example, it delays you opening it by six seconds, which seems like not a lot of time, but it feels like forever when you're waiting for the little bar to load and it'll ask you, do you really want to open Instagram? This is how many times you've attempted to open Instagram. And this is the last time that you have opened Instagram in the last 24 hours. And that little trigger to just stop the habit that becomes automatic can be really helpful. So you can have those six seconds to check yourself and say, what am I going to do when the app opens? Like, am I just checking automatically, not even thinking about it, which is what most people are probably doing if they're feeling like social media is a time suck or it's not being productive? Or are there specific things that I need to do on the app? And I will say from using it for a long time that it can be really annoying if you're trying to like create a reel where you have to copy and paste other things to get the right colors or open it several times to do something on Instagram. But I had it on my phone for eight months this year and really do fully feel like I am not addicted to checking Instagram at all. Most of the time I check it on my desktop. Instagram's the only social media I use. So that's why I keep going back to that. But the desktop version is also much less addictive and much more limited too than the phone app. And so you could also set the boundary of I'm going to schedule things ahead of time. And if I'm engaging, I'm engaging on the desktop because you can still watch stories and comment. You can still search and answer your DMs and all that stuff. But it's less likely that you're going to get caught up in that scroll. Oh my gosh. I love those tips so much. And I I literally need to download that app because I would love just the the visual reminder to be like, hey, what are, what are you what are you doing here? What are you getting on here for? I think it's also- so powerful. It also tracks your stats so you can see over time, like you've saved this many hours by using one sec or, you know, so it's kind of helpful to see, especially after you use it for a long amount of time. It can be totally life changing because we waste a lot of time on social media for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I love those tips. I mean, those are really tactical, but also just like a good, like I said, guardrail. So I love that so much. All right. I want to finish by shifting focus to you and your story. So I always love to ask my guests if there's a switch or a mindset shift that you've made to help show up authentically online, whether it's on social media or as a coach, when you engage with your clients or even just, you know, as you portray yourself and your offers and your services on your website, is there some sort of a shift that you've made to just step into yourself a little bit more? Tell us about that. Yeah, this is definitely the hardest question that you had on this <laughs> list of questions for me because this has honestly been a huge struggle for me learning what it actually means to be myself as a business owner because of my background, um, especially entering entrepreneurship after an MBA program where it was very corporate. We were taught how to shake hands and network correctly and do the small talk thing and do interviews that were very business-like and not casual or relationship-oriented at all. And so coming out of that environment and into photography, especially, which Mm -hmm. was very chill and casual, I feel like it's taken me a long time to figure out who is the most authentic version of myself when I'm showing up for my business. Because the way that I act or the way that I'm talking now is a little bit different than the way that I would talk to my husband or talk to my friends. I'm a lot more like goofy and weird when I'm not on podcasts. And so there is an element of me showing up as this slightly more polished version of myself. But I think it's taken me a long time to learn how to be more of myself in my business because for so much of my life, I was focused on fitting in 
And Mm -hmm. most people growing up in this culture, the pressure to fit in and conform and not stand out and try to just be like everybody else because that's the cool thing to do. It's ingrained at us from a very young age. And for me, that's something that I struggled with a lot as I was growing up in a small town where everybody knew everybody's business and I did not want to stand out. I did not want Mm. to be anything like myself if that was going to get me attention. I'm very introverted. So anything attention oriented, I just wanted to avoid. And it, I mean, I'm in my thirties now, so I feel like it's been a long time coming to Mm -hmm. break out of that habit. And make standing out and being myself comfortable because to be yourself is to stand out. Everybody is unique and has their own quirks and their unique personalities. And it can be really uncomfortable. Being a business owner in general is really uncomfortable. It's a vulnerable place to be, to put yourself out there and be audacious enough to say that I can offer you value and you should pay me for that value. That in itself is uncomfortable, let alone trying to be yourself while doing that. Mm-hmm. For anyone who's struggling with that, I just want to say that I struggle too, and it's a hard thing to do. But to answer yeah. your question on what's actually helped, I think for me, having a life outside of my business and making it a habit to do things on a daily and weekly basis that do make me feel really authentically like myself, talking like myself, spending time with friends and family, practicing being myself. And I think that took some growing into for me to feel comfortable around different people and in different situations. But the more that I spend, the more time I spend living my life and doing things that I like doing outside of business, the more stories I have to share that I can incorporate into my business in an authentic way that does show like this is who I am. And I talk about this this way, but also it relates to business, right? And so finding those connections between my personal life and what is personal to me and my business and the way that I show up has probably been the most helpful piece. But I think there's also just that constant reminder and seeing this happen over and over again in my business and in my clients' businesses that being yourself gets results. Mm -hmm. And trying to put yourself into a box or like act like somebody you're not or try to be good at things that you're not naturally good at, they don't lead to success. They lead to burnout and to you not feeling great about the work that you're doing or how you're showing up. And just from experience, putting myself out there and doing things that made me uncomfortable and the connections that I've made as a result of that and also seeing the connections that my clients have made and my business friends have made and just seeing the patterns evolve, I think has also pushed me to get comfortable being Mm -hmm. myself. But I definitely am not perfect at it. It's a work in progress still for me. Yeah, I think that's so true that there's something about business ownership that is so vulnerable because it is so courageous to to step out and say, I know how to do this. And it's so great that I want you to pay me for it. It Mm -hmm. is such a big courageous step to make. And it feels, at least to me, it felt very foreign, right? Like I was, I was just a teacher, just being in quotation marks, right? Like I, I was just like the, the cog in the machine delivering the information. Right. But then when I stepped into business ownership, it was a different posture. It was a completely different role that I was occupying. I wasn't just feeling like I was the deliverer of information. I was Mm -hmm. the creator of it in a completely different way. And that comes with a lot of responsibility, but it also comes with a lot of freedom and joy and ownership and authenticity that's required, right? And so Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the pieces and parts of business ownership that feel vulnerable are because it is such a courageous step to make. I also feel like as a woman, there is something about your 30s that is just magic. Like I'm I'm 37, so I'm near I'm closer to the 40s than I am to the 30s at this point. But there is something magic about the 30s where the insecurities that I remember feeling as a high school student or a college student or as a newlywed, like those have just broken away a little bit. And what's left is the true authentic version of of myself that that I'm so comfortable with. And by surrounding myself with people who know that version, and also 
embracing that version of me as the business owner, as the Sarah behind the business has been really key. Yeah. I, you just made me think about my 30th birthday party. I'll never forget it. It wasn't a party. I went out to dinner with a bunch of my girlfriends and Mm -hmm. we, I asked the question around the table, like, what have you guys all thought that you've learned in your twenties or what is the number one thing that you took away from your twenties entering your thirties? Not everybody was 30 at that point, but the two trends that came up for nearly everybody at the table was first, they wasted too much time pursuing achievements that didn't matter and realize that there's a lot more to life that's more meaningful than chasing after things in that fashion. And then the second thing is that they wish that they had been themselves sooner. Like I Mm. wish that I had felt comfortable just being myself and having people take it or leave it sooner instead of trying to force myself into being somebody that I wasn't trying to be. And I'm never going to forget that that conversation. But like you said, there is something really vulnerable about showing up authentically because as a business person, you're going to get rejection. So Mm -hmm. some people won't like it if I talk about being a Christian or I talk about my faith and that's okay. Not everyone has to align with that. And there's certain things where if I show up and be myself, I'm going to attract certain people to me because they align with my values and also other people aren't going to like it. And Mm -hmm. that's hard. Even if it's something I really believe in, it's the person that I truly am. Being rejected is not fun for anybody. And so it's worth it, but it's not easy. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really great thing to end on is a lot of things in business are worth it, but not easy. Productivity, business ownership in general, but owning who you are and showing up that way. That is something that, again, is not easy, but is always worth it. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here, my friend. I'm so grateful for you. We will have all of the links for you in the show notes. Um, I am sending you a big virtual hug. I wish Iowa City was just a little bit closer. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you so much, guys, for listening. And this is your copywriter on call signing off for today. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Copywriter On Call podcast. If this episode has you feeling all sorts of inspired to show up as yourself online, click that subscribe button so you don't miss my stories or practical advice to help you express your quirky, vulnerable, and authentic self online. Chat soon.